before we look at the Lord's word, shall we uh, just spend some time in prayer? Our loving Heavenly Father, we come before you now. We thank you for this day, for a day set aside to look into your things. We thank you for the time we've spent around the table this morning, remembering our Saviour, rejoicing in who he is and all that he has accomplished in his authority, in his wonders, his powers and the fact that he came to this world to save us. Father, we do pray now that as we look into your word that we will rejoice in it, that we will enjoy seeing something of our Saviour in it, something of the power of our God in these words and of Habakkuk. Father, we do pray that you would bless those who can't be here. Just pray for Barbara, for Roger, for Emma. Lord, we do ask that you just keep them safe and bless them wherever they are. We ask these things in your precious name, giving thanks. Amen. So I thought, just for a change, we would look at something Old Testament. Um, and I thought the book of Habakkuk might be quite pertinent for the society we live in today. Um, and now you've all opened to Habakkuk, I'm going to read out of Deut- Deuteronomy, but it's okay, I'm going to put it up on the screen. So I'm going to just begin with these words, um, as they are <coughs> pertinent, I think, to the rest of what Habakkuk has to say. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 1. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Let my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, as the raindrops on the tender herb, and as showers on the grass. For I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. In this book, much written much later, we see all the same attributes of God as we read through Habakkuk, written by, by Moses, the, the words we just read, they continue to apply in Habakkuk's day and continue through to today and on to eternity. He is an unchanging God. Turn to Habakkuk, please. Uh, Just um, so you know, I'm going to read the whole book. Um, I thought of doing what they did in in the Old Testament, getting everybody to stand outside in the rain, but I thought maybe that's probably a little unfair. So I thought we could just read the whole book. This 50 odd verses so but it's quite nice it's a lovely book to read as a as a lump because there is just so much in it and it all flows from one to the other so i thought it would be and the, the finish is such a rejoicing in in in, in chapter three um i titled this hope um because when you read chapter three you see the hope that we have and you see these verses through it that we have that give us so much hope um when i thought about the book it's a bit like discussions with god isn't it and then you see God's reply. And I kind of thought of that term, I have good news, and I have bad news. And that kind of sums up the book, I have good news, and I have bad news, and he's probably the other way around, I have bad news, but I also have good news. Let's just read the book of Habakkuk. Beginning in verse 1. The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear, even cry out to you, violence and you will not save and why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble for plundering and violence are before me there is strife and contention arises therefore the law is powerless and justice never goes forth for the wicked surround the righteous therefore perverse judgment proceeds the lord's reply look among the nations and watch be utterly astounded for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe though it were told you for indeed I am raising up the Chaldeans a bitter and hasty nation which marches through the breadth of the land to possess dwelling places that are not theirs they are terrible and dreadful their judgment and their dignity proceed from themselves their horses also are swifter than leopards and more fierce than evening wolves 
Their chargers charge ahead, their cavalry comes from afar, they fly as the eagle that hastens to eat. They all come for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind. They gather captives like sand, they scoff at kings and princes are scorned by them. They deride every stronghold, for they heap up earthen mounds and seize it. Then his mind changes and he transgresses. He commits offence, ascribing his pa this power to his God. The prophet's second question. Are you not from everlasting? O Lord, my God, my Holy One, we shall not die. O Lord, you have appointed them for judgment. O Rock, you have marked them for correction. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil, and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously, and hold your tongue when the wicked devours? A person more righteous than he. Why do you make men like fish of the sea, like creeping things that have no ruler over them? They take up all of them with a hook. They catch them in their net and gather them in their dragnet. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they sacrifice to their net and burn incense to their dragnet. Because by them their share is sumptuous and their food plentiful. Shall they therefore empty their net and continue to slay righteous nations without pity? <coughs> I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. The Lord replies, Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it will speak, and will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Indeed, because the transgression, but he transgresses by wine, he is a proud man. And he does not stay at home, because he enlarges his desire as hell. And he is like death and cannot be satisfied. He <coughs> gathers to himself all nations and heaps up for himself all peoples. Will not, will not all these take up a proverb against him, and a taunting riddle against him, and say, Woe to him in, who increases who is not, who, what is not his? How long? And to him who loads himself with many pledges, will not your creditors rise up suddenly? Will they not awaken who oppress you, and who will become you, and you will become their booty, because you have plundered many nations? All the remnant of the people shall plunder you, because of men's blood and the violence of the land and the city, and of all who dwell in it. Woe to him who covets evil gain in for his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he, may be, that he may be delivered from the power of disaster, and give shameful counsel to your house, cutting off many peoples, and sin against your soul, for the stone will cry out from the wall, and the beam from the timbers will answer it. Woe to him who builds a town with bloodshed, who establishes a city by iniquity. Behold, is it not of the Lord of hosts that the peoples labour to feed the fire and nations weary themselves in vain for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea woe to him who gives drink to his neighbour pressing him to your bottle even to make him drunk that you may look on his nakedness you are filled with shame instead of glory you also drink and be exposed as uncircumcised the cup of the Lord's right hand will be turned against you, and utter shame will be on your glory. For violence done at Lebanon will cover you, and the plunder of beasts, which made them afraid because of men's blood, and the violence of the land and the city, and of all who dwell in it. What profit is the image that its maker should carve it? The moulded image, a teacher of lies, that the maker of its mould should trust in it, to make mute idols. Woe to him who says to the wood, Awake, to silent stone, Arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, yet in it 
there is no breath at all. The prophet's prayer. The prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shigionoth. O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known in wrath. Remember mercy. God came from Timon, the Holy One from Mount Para, Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light and he, his, he had rays flashing from his hand and there his power was hidden. Before him went pestilence and fever followed at his feet. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and startled the nations and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills bowed. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Kushan in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian trembled. O oh Lord, were you displeased with the rivers? Was your anger against the rivers? Was your wrath against the sea that you rode on your horses, your chariots of salvation? Your bow was made quite ready. Oaths were sworn over your arrows. Selah. You divided the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered its voice and lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of your arrows they went, at the shining of your glittering spear. You marched through the land in indignation. You trampled the nations in anger. You went forth from, for the salvation of your people, for salvation with your anointed. You struck the head from the house of the wicked by laying bare from the foundation to the neck. Selah. You thrust through with his own arrows the head of his villages. They came out like a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was like feasting in, on the poor in secret. You walked through the sea with your horses, through the heap of great waters. When I heard, my body trembled. My lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines. Though the labour of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stall, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet and he will make me walk on my high hills. To the chief musician with my stringed instruments. May the Lord bless the reading of his word and all that we have just read in it. So what I wanted to do today was just to um, set up a little bit of, of about Habakkuk, his times, what was going on around him a little bit, what was what had been going on and what was coming I suppose you could look at it like that. His name actually means embrace and is a reduplication apparently of the word for embrace or a double embrace if you like and in, Jew in Jewish terms used to indicate increased emphasis it's seen in the book that he certainly embraces his God and we see him embracing all the judgments of God those that are hard to understand and bear and also those that are for good and concludes that he is embraced if you like by God as well there is little said of him or by him of himself, but much can be learned in his attitude and demeanour and, and the way he carries himself before God. We're told he is a prophet in verse 1. The book is included in the canon of Scripture and the Old Testament is the, of the Old Testament and is accepted uh, by the Jews as those of an authentic writer appointed by God and included in their holy writings 
those books that are outside of the Torah. His claim as a prophet is not just one of personal reputation or desire for recognition or Jewish appointment, but is validated. First by God, who spoke to him directly. Although he does not expressly state God said or similar, but the reply and the accuracy of the prophecy confirm he spoke with God. But the prophecy was shown by the fulfillment recorded in time by his personal desire and motivation and actions seen throughout the book. We see that the, some of the verses from the book both be, being used both in, by Paul in Romans 1 and 17 and the writer to the Hebrews in chapter 10 verse 38 referred to this foundational verse in the New Testament in 2 verse 4, the just shall live by his faith. The book is one of the great books of hope and as, in, as indicated when we started, Habakkuk goes from great distress to great hope. And we see by the end of the book his deeper understanding of God and his worship because he is God and is worthy of all praise, whether his decisions are understood or not. As we read from Deuteronomy at the start, he is a God of perfect justice. And we were reminded when Abraham said in Genesis chapter 18, shall not the judge of all the earth do right. He lived, uh, he lived in a, a, a great time of s great sin in Judah. They had the examples of the tribes of Israel to look upon from, uh, from about 140 years previously. So you can see in this side you'll see uh, along that um, whole section you can see the... Um, when these button lights the light up, doesn't it? So you can see that he's around about this area you'll see is Habakkuk. But this is the, the kings of Israel. And they've gone into captivity about 140 years or thereabouts before. You can argue over the dates, but at the end of the day, they've gone in and they had that warning already. And this is the, the time Habakkuk was living in. They could look back and see what happens when you don't obey God from their own people. He, they had their own examples to follow and yet chose to ignore it. The third chart gives all the kings of Israel and Judah after they split when Solomon dies and his son Rehoboam takes the throne and threatens the tribes with greater tributes than those his father had laid off on the people and that they split. This next slide gives you a, a bit more of a close-up. You can see just the end in the red there. You can see where uh, the Samaria falls, Israel goes into captivity and you can see above in the blue the line of Judah until uh, Jerusalem is dis destroyed. It's an expanded view of the kings and where the prophets fit in. The twelve minor prophets which are the books we tend to stumble over in naming uh, and, and the order and then there's the five major prophets. It does not indicate that one is more important than the other, just that God has had recorded for us those things that are for our learning. Some have more to say than others, but all chosen by God. For context, this is a chart that gives the considered dates of the prophets and the tribes of Israel and Judah and their later kings. It's thought that Habakkuk, you can see him there uh, in the green at the top, above towards the end of that blue line on the very top green line Habakkuk you can see he's uh, towards the end so he's prophesying towards the end of the time of Judah as, a, as an individual nation before they get overtaken it's thought that Habakkuk uh, is prophesying in the last few kings maybe towards the, after Josiah who was a good king uh, and certainly towards the last pair he had seen things slipping the book is positioned just after Nahum. But remember that the books of the Bible are not placed chronologically often, and many will overlap the timelines of another, but not next door to each other in the Bible layout. Nahum predicts the fall of the Assyrians, who had treated the people of God with contempt and cruelty, and they were punished as Nahum prophesied. But there are other interesting considerations in the wonder and the power of, of authority of God. Nineveh fell about 150 years 
after the word of God was preached there by Jonah. The people and the king were turned from their wicked ways and they were saved from destruction. And if you read the introduction to Jonah, it can be seen that the people then and when Nahum and, and when Habakkuk write, the same accusations were made of them. Nothing changes. It's only 150 years later that all that changed in the heart of the nation and the worship of God is now gone. And they have reverted to their previous ways. And God brings judgment upon them through the Babylonians which are to come. Here we see Judah having had a recent good king in Josiah who restored the temple worship and the reading of the law. The destruction of various places of alternative worship to different gods and deities replaced by those kings who did not take the warnings of God seriously who ignored the sin that was rife in the land and, and encouraged it a short time later falling into the judgment of God through the Chaldeans described by God as that bitter and hasty nation we read recently in Colossians of one who described the people of Crete as liars and evil beasts and slow bellies not the sort of description you would want of your nation here God gives a fearful description of this nation which are warlike, cruel and unrelenting when the later descriptions are seen in the, in the first chapter it suggests that this was the normal practice and way of operation for these people bringing fear wherever they went now, the narrative fits in around this sort of timeline of the Old Testament and you can see uh, down there towards the middle period so you've got all the part there from creation just as an idea to give you some idea when the, the, the we're talking about here you've got the fall of the northern ki kingdom uh, down there in uh, 733 and then six fall of the southern kingdom uh, just around about Daniel's time between Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel and Daniel so that's the sort of area we're talking about in historical terms that's when the narrative fits around there is little history given, little to identify with any of the known history of the time and it is considered likely that it is to serve as a reminder for every generation. The evidence is, is that the circle continues, the cycle of failure and sin is ever present. It was as relevant then as it is now. The questions then that Habakkuk raised were, and, and still are, are today, uh, how could God? Why does God? People will always want to question God's motive and decisions ultimately we read in chapter 2 verse 4 we are to walk by faith not by sight and to trust that whatever befalls us is within the providence and will of God easy to write and say and as evidenced by Habakkuk considerably harder to sometimes understand but we should be encouraged as we read and study this book in the certainty of God's goodness and promises it is the final conclusion of this prophet that it is the, of the greatest importance to recognize God for who he is as much as we're able in our weakness. And it is his glory that we should be focused on. His power, his ability, not the things of man that are going around, around us at the time. So as an overview, there are, I put it down as two questions, two answers, one conclusion. The question of unpunished sin from Habakkuk, the promise of punishment to come, is God's response. The question of unfair punishment by Habakkuk, the punishment of those who are unjust and ascribe their success to another God, God's response. The conclusion is a statement of faith in some of the best poetry written according to Hebrew scholars. Habakkuk's closing vision in chapter 3 there are several verses of note and key verses the key verses to four, verse 4 that we've considered already but the just shall live by the, his faith there are many that offer faith in something and all offer faith not founded in the God of creation in many religions all teaching does not offer real hope or real truth they are what we considered in Colossians false teachers you see here's some of the verses that I picked out chapter 1 verse 12 
Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them for judgment, and O mighty God, you have established them for correction. How powerful is our God? All powerful. No matter who we come up against, no matter how tough the nation, no matter how difficult the time is, no matter how sinful the people are, they have to come before God Almighty. And we are that are His, that serious promise. We shall not die. We have everlasting life. Let's rejoice in that this morning. We thought about that as we sat around the table this morning, didn't we? Eternal life, eternal, eternal rejoicing in glory. Chapter 2, verse 14. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. What a day that's going to be. It didn't come in Habakkuk's lifetime, but it's coming. It may come in our time, in our lifetime, we don't know. But there is definitely a day coming when everyone will recognize who God is. But the Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before Him. It is coming a time when every man, every woman, anyone who has any grief with God, anyone who thinks that they have questions to ask, will remain silent. There is nothing to say. He is holy. They will be silent. Chapter 3, verse 2. O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. With wrath, remember mercy. Is that not our cry this morning? Is that not why, where we're at? O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. No matter how difficult it is around us, no matter what our country's doing, what it's going through, no matter what's happening in our time, in our town, in our area, in our lives, in wrath. Remember mercy. 3 verse 17, Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labour of the olive tree may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, when there's nothing, yet I will rejoice. In the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. Habakkuk is prophesying during the latter days of Judah's freedom. Before they go into captivity. The, com they co the complaints suggest that the reforms of Josiah were soon forgotten. And he's looking to the coming of the Chaldeans who would also sweep away the domination of these Assyrians. Just to context, the Assyrians ruled this, this area. Beginning here, their expansion in about 900 BC. And the capital, capital Nineveh was overthrown as prophesied by Nahum in 612 BC by the Babylonians who basically took over their patch. You can see on the next one, that's the Babylonian patch, pretty much the same as the Assyrians. It's only where that was worth having, they took off them. So between 612 and 609, the capital city of the Assyrians at that time was Nineveh. And the people there had gone back to their old ways and forgotten God after Jonah's preaching. And the judgment prom promised by Nahum and Zephaniah would be fulfilled. Zephaniah 2.13 And he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria and will make Nineveh a desolation and, a dry, and dry like a wilderness. To this day Nineveh is a deserted place. It's discovered in the 18th century as a couple of mounds that have since been excavated. Habakkuk here is looking to the day when Judah would be overrun by the incoming uh, hordes, the Chaldeans, as the Babylonian Empire begins to expand and further forward to when God would judge the Babylonians. The Babylonians were, were, excuse me, were in ascendancy for about 70 years from 626 to 539, after which their empire was removed by the Medo-Persian Empire. The roots of the Chaldeans lie in the Genesis record, and they are considered the descendants of Noah's son Shem. 
We also know that Terah was father of Abraham and the father of the people being discussed in the book were from Ur of the Chaldea. There is a lot of information for us to look at. A lot of history for us if you go to the British Museum and online that corroborate the narrative of the history of these nations with that of the Bible through archaeological digs that have found many buried treasures and information that validates the history of these peoples. In the opening verses we get a picture of the world he is living in. One that Habakkuk is struggling with. And it seems strange that such strong words are used. But I was observing the things that are currently going on in the island of Haiti. The breakdown of law and order. Where there is no effective government. And various gangs are running amok. Releasing prisoners, killing the citizens without any civil authority able to withstand them. Robbing the local community. Violence and looting. Prisoners are released from jails and can be quickly seen how men and women slide into the same sort of characteristics of sinful actions as Habakkuk, as Habakkuk rehearses before God, telling him of all that is happening without any justice being served on the perpetrators. But Habakkuk is, is told and knows, but God sees and knows all things and will judge as becomes evident. So the book starts with these words. The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. We learn of the writer's name and his position, Habakkuk, and he is a prophet of the God of Israel. We learn in the next verse, writing to the uh, two tribes that are currently not in exile, Judah and Benjamin, at the instruction of God. He starts by bringing to note his burden. The word has the thought of anguish behind it, something that creates in him great concern for the future for his people his burden can be split into two the burden of what he sees now the world around him the burden of what is to come as he's shown by God in the following verses his burden he speaks of here the judgment of God on the people of Judah is based on his first burden if his burden is in the prophecy of the punishment that God is about to de deliver he tells us in the first four verses of his personal burden at the actions of the people around him. And it would appear to relate not only to his own nation, but to the world around. Nineveh having slipped back to hold ways as had the king of, kings of Judah, the things he saw and heard were a real burden. And he brings them to God in the first instance. But not just once. This is a real burden. And he indicates in verse 2 that it was something that he had been concerned by for some time. And he continued to bring it before God. His burden for his people. His burden for the sin of his people in 2 to 4. His burden for the righteous. For, their, their, for there to be wrongs then must be those who are righteous as seen in verse 4. Doth compass about the righteous. His burden in continual prayer. How long shall I cry? His burden in unanswered prayer, and you will not hear. These are strong terms to come with before God, aren't they? It's a real challenge when we read the way that, 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 that Habakkuk is praying here. He's laying it out before God. He's not pulling punches, is he? How long shall I cry? You will not hear. But I notice there's a greater burden in answered prayer. It's a burden because he's the first to know of it. It's a personal burden. The prophecy is his and he is to absorb and pass it on. It's a burden because of the history of his people. They have a history of not doing what is right or faithfully following God and his law as given to Moses. It's a burden because of the history of the prophets in Israel who bring bad news or, or of godly correction to the nation. It's not always easy. On them. In Matthew chapter 23-29 it says, Woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of prophets and adorn the monuments of, of the righteous. And say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore you witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. 
Therefore indeed I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. That on you may come all the righteous blood shed on, on the earth. From the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly I say to you all these things will come upon this gen generation. O Jerusalem! Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wing wings. But you were not willing. The nation has, was known for its abuse of the prophets. So bringing what he had just heard would be a concern when you consider what was going on around him as he describes the times he lives in. It wouldn't have been comfortable, would it, to bring that message to this lot? It's a burden because he sees the punishment of the people by those God is sending. The destruction that follows in their wake at all levels. The knowledge of the things to come and the things they do to nations. It is this, prophet, the prophet Habakkuk, that God reveals the punishment that is to come shortly. One there is no escape from. My plan is to look at the prayer of Habakkuk and the answers over the coming weeks. I came across this poem this week in an, e in an email and thought it very appropriate for the book we have just begun. It came from America and I have adjusted the last line to reflect that it does not matter where we live. We need to be alive to the things that are happening in and around us, in our land, to be aware of the difficulties and the sin that pervades and be busy in prayer. To be burdened for our land, for the people, to be concerned over our people, both here and elsewhere. For the judgment of God is coming. And there will be many who go into eternity without salvation. It's a burden to us as we recall all those we know who are lost. All those we don't know. All those we love. And those we do not. Death is never full. Be burdened in ongoing prayer as we thought of Habakkuk was here's the prayer here's the, the poem I, I read I wept for my land last night I wept for a land where men were strong through faith and prayer and holy song where men were quick to punish wrong but gladly helped the weak along I wept for my land last night I wept for a land where men were free and God was feared from sea to sea, where men would humbly bow the knee, and now cry in pride, What's he to me? I wept for my land last night. I wept for my land where white and brown could safely walk the streets of town, and walk together without a frown, for fear the other would knock him down. I wept for my land last night. I wept for a land where men in schools had deep respect for democracy's tools and taught the young to obey the rules where, wise, where the wise were exalted and not the fools. I wept for my land last night. I wept for a land where the Bible's read and sentences passed on the guilty's head, where the honest are free from fear and dread, and God shall, justify, shall justly judge the dead. I wept for my land last night. real challenge isn't it when we last weep for our land there are many we know many who have died many marching casually ignorantly deliberately onto hell may we weep for our land may we bring before our God those that we love those that we don't know those that sometimes even we despise because their judgment is fierce Habakkuk lays open the judgment that was coming to Israel, uh, to Judah. That judgment is nothing compared with the judgment that is coming to individuals who don't know our Saviour. May we weep for our land. May we pray for our land. May we cry up to our God how we help our land day by day in our own lives. Shall we pray? A loving Heavenly Father, we do thank you that 
We have one in whom we can trust. We have one uh, whom is all in all. One who will only do what is right. And now, Father, we thank you that we have that great privilege of coming to know the Saviour, of being brought into the presence of our God. And you pray that our lives might reflect that. Father, as we think of your servant Habakkuk, as we think of his prayers and of his cries to his God, of <coughs> injustice, of sin in our, throughout the land, of everything being uh, destroyed that should be right, that was right, of the righteous being set aside. Oh, Father, we do pray that as we look around our world and we see these things day by day, that like the prophet we might pray, that we might desire that those we know, those we love, might be turned to the Saviour. Father, we do pray that we might be consistent in prayer as Habakkuk. That we might continually bring these things before our God. That they might affect our hearts and lives. But Father, we do thank you that we, can, we, we were reminded as we read that book that uh, in the end, our God overrules. There will be rejoicing. And we do thank you that one day we will see our Saviour face to face in all his glory in heaven. Our Father, we thank you for eternal life. We do pray that you will encourage us day by day to seek the lost, uh, to work out our salvation in fear and trembling, that we might know more of our Saviour. Give more thanks, that we might understand more of his love and delight in him day by day. Father, for those who are not here, we pray you'll bless and keep them. Uh, give them strength, we pray. We thank you for all your goodness to us. Every single day, we ask these things in our Saviour's precious name, giving thanks for Him. Amen.